The Agua Negra Deep Experiment Site, better known as the Andes Underground Laboratory, seeks to take advantage of the construction of the Agua Negra border crossing, located between Chile and Argentina, which, as its name indicates, will be located deep in the Andes Mountains, 1,750 meters below the surface. This project will integrate the work of scientists from Argentina, Chile, Brazil and Mexico, favoring a worldwide scientific collaboration, whose objective is to study neutrinos, dark matter and other unsolved mysteries of particle physics. In this video, we will see why they want to make a laboratory at such a depth, what is the relevance of its location and we will also talk in more detail about what are some of the experiments that will be performed there. To understand the relevance of the Andes project, we must first talk about what exactly they want to measure. To do this, we must look to the sky and delve into the subatomic world. Whether in our own solar system, our own galaxy or even from distant galaxies, the activities of different stars and other large-scale astronomical phenomena release large amounts of energy and particles that move through space at speeds close to or equal to the speed of light. Most of these particles, which are usually subatomic particles, which means they are smaller than an atom, such as protons, will be dispersed through space, but some of them will collide with our planet, or more specifically with our atmosphere. Despite being particles that would normally be able to stay in one piece as they travel through space, due to the high velocities at which they move and the atmosphere of our planet, what happens is something like this. When one of these particles collides with another atom or molecule, such as oxygen or nitrogen, it disintegrates, forming a shower of subatomic particles whose trajectory resembles the roots of a tree and eventually reaches the Earth's surface. This phenomenon is known as extensive air shower and both the particles that traveled through space and those generated after the collision are known as cosmic rays. These in general interact strongly with matter and can be easily detected with experiments on the Earth's surface, and in fact their study earned Victor Hess the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1936. This, in particular, laid the foundation for hundreds of other experiments that are carried out to this day and that have made it possible to classify exactly what these subatomic particles are and how they behave. However, not all particles coming from space are easy to detect, since some of them practically do not interact with matter, generating really weak or scarce signals that are impossible to detect or individualize when cosmic rays or other sources generate interferences in the measurements. To better understand this problem, let's imagine that we are a detector of a certain type of particle, or in this case, Pokemon. If they pass at a low frequency and without mixing with other Pokemon, we can perform the work without major problems. But, if they pass with a higher frequency and together with other similar Pokemon, there is a higher probability of making errors when counting. Now imagine this same scenario occurring thousands of times per second, with signals lasting milliseconds and with multiple particles generating similar signals, which we must distinguish with maximum precision. Of course, an electronic sensor specifically designed for this will be able to count the particles thousands of times faster and with greater precision than a human being, but it is still a rather complicated task to solve with the technology we have today. It is these types of low interaction particles that the Andes project seeks to study. More specifically, it seeks to study particles such as neutrinos or dark matter. Neutrinos are subatomic particles of very low mass which have no electric charge and do not decay or become any other type of particle, while dark matter is a particle that although it is known to exist in our universe due to multiple astrophysical observations that point to its influence, it is not known exactly what type of particle it is and its behavior does not correspond to any known type of particle. Now, what does all this have to do with the laboratory being built underground? To solve the problem of interference present during the experiments, the strategy is to use a material capable of stopping the particles that are not of interest to us, and thus reduce their interaction with the measuring instruments to the minimum possible, something like a sieve that only allows the smallest particles to pass through. Surely you have already noticed where this is going. The idea of having an underground laboratory follows the same logic, but taken to the extreme, with the 1,750 meters of mountain above the laboratory being the equivalent of the sieve. 
In fact, you have probably heard or seen that when working with a radioactive source, you need to take some measures, such as for example, positioning lead plates around it. This is done to keep the emitted particles imprisoned inside a certain container and prevent their interaction with unwanted external elements. Based on this, we could do the same on a larger scale, coating a laboratory with large amounts of lead or tungsten, materials with a high absorption capacity. Generally speaking, this could be a good idea, but the problem is that not all particles react in the same way to the obstacles presented to them. An alpha particle, for example, can be stopped by a few sheets of paper, while a beta particle is stopped by a thin metal plate. On the other hand, gamma rays and neutrons are stopped by a few centimeters of lead or concrete, while muons, another type of subatomic particle, can pass through hundreds of meters of Earth. And finally we have neutrinos, which thanks to all the characteristics I mentioned previously, penetrate through other objects practically without being affected, being able to cross hundreds of kilometers under the ground without stopping, even crossing the planet in some cases. This idea of creating an underground laboratory to detect neutrinos is not new, in fact there are already 10 other laboratories with similar characteristics in different countries around the world. Out of these, the deepest is Snow Lab in Sudbury, Canada, which is located 2,070 meters underground. So, if there are already so many of these laboratories, and even some of them are deeper than the Andes project, as in the case of Snow Lab, why make one more, and why specifically between Chile and Argentina? The first reason is to take advantage of the opportunity provided by the Agua Negra Tunnel, since there are few places in the world that are located at such depth and offer the ideal conditions for this type of laboratories, being more practical to join the efforts of such projects than to try to build all the necessary infrastructure just for the construction of a laboratory, however important it may be. The second reason is to create a high-impact laboratory in this area of particle physics that is led by a team of Latin American scientists and that fosters international collaboration with scientists from other countries. And finally, the third reason, perhaps the most important, is that this would be the first laboratory of these characteristics to be built in the southern hemisphere of our planet, which will allow the verification of results jointly with other laboratories. This is especially relevant for experiments that are affected by seasonal phenomena such as those focused on the study of dark matter, whose results show a cyclical behavior that repeats every year. One of the hypotheses as to why this happens is that our solar system is affected by a flow of dark matter that moves in a certain direction. So when our planet moves in the opposite direction to the dark matter the signals are stronger, and when it travels in the same direction the signals are weaker. But these same variations could be due to other factors such as weather, because as our planet moves through its orbit, the seasons change with the same frequency. If all the detectors are in the same hemisphere of the planet, there is no way to discern between which of the described situations may be occurring, as they will all follow the same seasonal changes. On the contrary, if there are detectors in both hemispheres, they would be affected by different seasonal changes related to climate, allowing these types of questions to be clarified. If the detector in one hemisphere is affected inversely to the one in the other hemisphere, that is, while one increases its activity the other decreases, we could say with greater certainty that the effect is due to the climate of each region and the tilt of the planet with respect to the sun. Now, if both detectors follow the same cycle, that is, both increase and decrease their activity, then we could say with greater certainty that the changes are due to a phenomenon on a larger scale, because regardless of the position of the experiment on our planet the factor that would most influence the results would be the direction in which our planet moves within the solar system. Up to this point we have only talked in general terms about the objective of the lab, but we have not specified what experiments will be performed or how exactly they will be composed. If we see the planimetry of the laboratory we will realize that although there are some sections of the infrastructure whose use has already been defined, others have more generic names, and this makes a lot of sense, because a place of these characteristics can be used for multiple studies, having a utility that will extend for dozens if not hundreds of years. Just to name a few, it is expected to be able to investigate the detection of dark matter, double beta nuclear decay, 
geophysics studies, biology studies related to radiation damage, nuclear astrophysics, low radioactivity measurements, and of course neutrino detection, which we will talk about in more detail in a next video in which we will analyze the Super Cameo Candy, one of the most famous neutrino detectors in the world, located in Japan. I want to thank Claudio Dib, PhD in physics and coordinator of the Andes project from the Chilean side, for using his time on this, helping us to maintain the technical rigor of this video and also helping us understand the scope of this mega project. As always I hope you liked this video, and if you think what we do is worthwhile, remember that you can support us on Patreon to make more and better videos. That's all for now and see you in the next video.